I appreciate so very much that fervent prayer that we've just been led in. It is so good to see a number of our graduates with us for the lectureship and to be able to hear about the good things that they're involved in. I was just quickly counting the other evening the number of preachers that are working with congregations in the West Virginia area and uh, even a little bit across the river, I guess, uh, some, and I counted quickly 11 or 12. And those are 11 or 12 preachers that uh, would not perhaps uh, be preaching in this area were it not for this school, because I believe not only is it the case that we are blessed to train preachers, but to see that this area is benefited by it. And that's a great thing. And I appreciate the opportunity to stand before you on this occasion for the lectureship committee, for Brother Cooper, for the elders, for everyone involved with this work of this school. This is a great work. And it's a work that, uh, as is often the case with works of this magnitude, it's far beyond any one person or any few people, it involves so many, and we're grateful for it. Brother Varner mentioned that uh, he found himself reading and studying the book of Psalms as he gets older, and I, I think I know a little bit about what he's talking about, though he's older than I am, and he tends to forget a little bit more than I do because Tommy Tucker gave me the real story about his time. Tommy didn't tell him to take my time. Uh, he said, you're to quit at 1045. He said, that's when you're to quit. And uh, he said, can I go a little longer? He said, that's Brother Pugh's time, so don't do that. Now, I also took a little bit of liberty to add a few things to what Tommy said. These have been great speeches that we've heard, Brother Conley and Brother Barner. And I was telling Frank Higginbotham, I've always thought it would be great, Emmanuel, if I could deliver a lecture on the same day that Brother Higginbotham delivers his. He is our closing speaker annually. And I thought if I could just do that, maybe I finally arrived. And today's the day. And Brother Higginbotham will be speaking this evening. But there are others whom I have such great respect for, along with these whom I've mentioned, and I hope that you'll hear them. And we appreciate each of the speakers. Make sure you get a copy of this lectureship book. And Brother West, I know, has worked hard on it. Lynn Miller has worked hard on it, and a number of other people. And there is no way, in most cases, that the material that has been gathered for these lectures can be delivered in the period of time that you have for this presentation. So you see, you have the best of both. You're able to hear these speakers, and they share the research and the study that they've done. But you're also able to take this book, and I've read these lectures and you'll benefit from them and I look forward to reading them again and again and again and to profit from them. I mentioned Brother Varner talking about Psalms. I find myself needing to pray more, don't you, as you get older? And I especially need it because Sharon and I have been blessed with another grandchild. Chip and his wife had a little baby girl one week ago last Saturday. I've just been trying to think, how could I get that in? You know, I just, and uh, if you're further interested, I have some pictures in my pocket. I, I wanted to make sure this morning that I had my sermon in my pocket, but also want to make sure I had those pictures. I didn't want to be like the uh, absent-minded professor I heard about. He was a biology teacher, and uh, he put a frog in his pocket for an experiment that day, and he put his sandwich for 
his lunch in his pocket. And uh, in the afternoon after lunch, he went to get the frog, and the frog was not there. And he went to the other pocket, and here was his sandwich. And he said, that's strange. I distinctly remember having my lunch today. <laughs> now think about it. It was the frog. <laughs> The conversion of Saul of Tarsus provides an unanswerable argument for Christianity. And this was the thesis of this gentleman that Brother Varner mentioned in his lecture this morning, George Littleton. Littleton in his classic volume on the conversion of Paul, first published anonymously in 1747 when Littleton was but 38 years of age. He was educated at Oxford. He entered Parliament. He became Commissioner of the Treasury. T.T. Bidoff says of Littleton and his friend Gilbert West that both of them had been influenced greatly by skeptical philosophy and infidelity with regard to the Christian faith had held sway over them. But both Littleton and West examined Christianity again, and they deserted their unbelief. And when they came to faith in the Christ and in the system of Christianity, it resulted in two classical works on Christian evidences. The first, that being the work by Littleton on the conversion of Paul and the second being the work by Gilbert West on the resurrection. Both of these works were done in 1747. I learned just recently that the work by Gilbert West on the resurrection done in 1747 was actually reprinted twice that very year. And so there is a third edition that very year. And of course, it's been reprinted even in addition to that. In correspondence with Mr. West, Littleton refers to a conversation that the two of them had had about the Christian religion. And it was during this conversation, he said, that he expressed his conclusion that, quote, the conversion and the apostleship of Paul by itself provided demonstration sufficient to prove Christianity to be a divine revelation. Now we fast forward to the century in which we're living and there is another British professor, the late Dr. Anthony Flew, who in his book titled There Is a God wrote a fascinating record of why he renounced atheism. And in this book, which is subtitled, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind, Dr. Flew says the following, and I quote, I think that the Christian religion is the one religion that most clearly deserves to be honored and respected, end of quote. He went on to say in another place in this book, and I quote, no other religion other than the Christian religion enjoys anything like what he calls the combination of Jesus and Paul. There are two lines of evidence in reference to Saul of Tarsus that I believe manifest Christianity to be the one true religion. Brother Kessinger dealt with the first of these in the lecture that he presented on the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. It is my assignment to deal with the second. Not only is it the case that the conversion of the person, Saul, which of course we read about in some detail in no less than three places 
in the Acts of the Apostles, Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26, not only is it the case that that, when properly studied, will lead us to the conclusion that Christianity has to be the one true religion, but it also is the case that the content of the presentation of Christianity as made by this very man, Saul of Tarsus, whom we know as the Apostle Paul with regard to the Christian faith, that the very content of the presentation that he made of Christianity proves it to be the one true religion. And it is this with which I'm concerned in this study this morning. We're talking about Paul's case for Christianity. That simply means the argument that Paul made with regard to Christianity being the one true religion. And specifically this morning, I want to direct our attention to a section of scripture in the final of these three accounts of his conversion, uh, that being in Acts 26, and in particular verses 19 through 29, where we have what it seems to me to be a remarkable summation of the case for Christianity as presented by the Apostle Paul. Now in this chapter, the Apostle Paul, the record tells us, was appearing before Agrippa the king. This is prior, of course, to his embarking on his journey to Rome, where he made that personal legal appeal to Emperor Caesar. It is significant to note that as you read Acts 26, and from the very outset, verse 1, and then later you see it at verse 24, that this is called Paul's defense. I do not believe that this is simply a personal defense. I do not believe that this is simply Paul in some fashion personally defending himself uh, to get off the hook. But rather this is an apologetical presentation. Now don't let that word scare you. It is a word that comes from the very word that the Apostle Peter uses in 1 Peter 3 and 15 when he says that we need to be ready to give an answer or to make a defense. And the words that are used here in Acts 26 relate to that very word. After he reviews the events on the road to Damascus that resulted in what surely we could term, not doing any injustice to what happened here, a cataclysmic change in the life of this Hebrew of Hebrews. He then makes this presentation concerning the very essence of the case for Christianity. Barclay calls the conversion of Saul of Tarsus the most famous one in all history. And in the early part of this chapter, we have at least some of the details, not all of them, but at least some of the details concerning the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. But then as we come to verse 19, we read the following. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. For these reasons the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Now as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. 
For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. A.T. Robertson calls this the fullest of all Paul's defenses. In fact, he goes on to call it a masterpiece of noble apologetic. And I believe as you study this, though it is brief in one sense, it is of such a nature that it marvelously implies three very foundational characteristics of the case or the argument for the truth of Christianity. Now there are others, and I've even dealt with some additional ones in the material in the book. But for our purposes this morning, I should like to just focus upon three of these. I appreciated Brother Workman's uh, great sermon the other evening on Acts chapter 2 and verses 22 through 36. And especially appreciate this point where he set out, and I'd never heard that before, that Peter had three points. Did you get that if you were here? That was good, Gary. And that makes me feel better this morning. I had three points. What are they? Number one, the case for Christianity as presented by Paul was biblically based. Paul's case for Christianity was biblically based. Look at what he says in verse 22. He says, I stand saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. As has been set forth so many times throughout this series of lectures and was so wonderfully set forth in the one immediately preceding this one. Christianity claims to be the fulfillment of what has been foretold and foreshadowed in the Old Testament scriptures. The authority of Christianity rests in the authority of the sacred writings, in the authority of the Holy Scriptures, the Holy Bible. That's the authority that we have for Christianity. Paul, of course, says it best in places like 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14 when he told Timothy, himself a preacher of Jesus Christ, you continue in the things that you've learned and been assured of. Notice that. These are things that you can be sure of, knowing of whom you've learned them, and that from a child you've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Christianity makes the claim to be the revelation of God in the incarnate word, God in the flesh. John chapter 1, 1 to 3. And then, of course, that connects up with regard to helping us see the one to whom John was referring in those first three verses in verse 14 when he says that word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But I say to you this morning that the incarnate word, the word in the body, is only as believable as is the inscripturated word, the word in the book. There's the authority. The integrity of the person of Jesus Christ is essentially connected to the integrity of the presentation of that person in the scriptures, the Bible. The case for Christianity then, as Paul preached it, 
ultimately is made from the Bible itself. Now, of course, he was an inspired man, as were the other apostles and others upon whom the apostles laid their hands. But don't ever miss this point. Here you have, even as a passage was read earlier today from Acts 17, what did he do when he went into the synagogue? He took the Bible. He took the scriptures. And he set those scriptures before them. Certainly the Old Testament scriptures. But if that was the case with regard to that, and the reason being, of course, here we have the foretelling of what now had been fulfilled and foreshadowed, how much more should it be obvious to us today that that's what we ought to be doing? That is, taking all of God's revelation as we have it in its written form and preach it and teach it. Jesus Christ is the revelation of God. But this revelation is made manifest by the prophetic scriptures. And from the very outset of that great letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome, Romans chapter 1, and then in Romans 16 at the conclusion of that great book, we see this to be the case. That the mystery of the gospel is unfolded, you see, through the scriptures. I want you to notice in connection with what Paul says here in Acts 22 and how that he says he is saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. And then notice that connects up with how he then says later, having obtained help from God to this day I stand witnessing both to small and great. And of course he could do that. I cannot do that today. I am not an eyewitness but I can proclaim to you the case that he presented as an eyewitness and along with the other apostles who were eyewitnesses, and that's the authority behind the case, along with this. Notice how this connects. You have the scriptures, he says, I'm saying nothing other than those things which the prophets and Moses said would come, but then you have him saying, to this day I stand witnessing as an eyewitness to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. It seems to me that's the very sort of thing in principle that you have in 2 Peter chapter 1. When Peter speaking about that which he had seen with his very eyes and heard with his very ears on the Mount of Transfiguration, says specifically in reference to that, though there is a sense in which that that which he says concerning that one event can be said concerning all, at least in principle, that they saw and heard as eyewitnesses, when he says, we have not followed cunningly devised myths or cleverly devised fables. When we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is affirming we did not invent these things artfully. We did not invent these things artificially. We were eyewitnesses, and in particular, Peter's talking about the event of the transfiguration. And he speaks of how that they heard the very voice of God the Father. When Jesus received from God the Father honor and glory, there was born such a voice to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And he says, This voice we ourselves heard born out of heaven when we were with him in the holy mount. And so here is a space and time event and they are hearing and they are seeing this is not a fable. This is is verified by the strength of this eyewitness testimony from witnesses of integrity. And we don't have the time to go through all those points related to that, that needs to be done, that can be done. And there's good material that you can study to do that. But here's the point I want to make. Notice then that Peter, and I see this very sort of thing happening here with Paul in Acts 26. Notice Peter then goes on to say, and we have the word of prophecy made more sure. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is a private interpretation. Now, that's not talking about a person studying the Bible and you can't interpret it. 
privately. That's not what the context of this is. The limitation, in fact, here is not placed upon the reader of Scripture. The limitation, if there is a limitation, and there is, is placed upon the writer of Scripture. But this was not the kind of thing where they said, oh, I think I'll write Scripture. So they start writing and giving their their religious views and their philosophical views and that sort of thing. He says, no, that's not it at all. It did not have its origin in some individual, some human. No prophecy ever came by the will of man. You see, that connects up with verse 20. No prophecy ever came by the will of man, but men, holy men of God, spoke being moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, what do we have here? Among other things, we have these two standout points. Christianity is a historic case. It's a case that involves actual events verified by eyewitnesses, but it is not only that, it is a case that is confirmed in its veracity by inspiration. Now, there is some question as to what is meant here when he says we have the word of prophecy made more sure. I do not believe that this statement in any way should be taken to mean that Peter is saying either, well, our experience is less certain, and so the scripture makes it more certain. I don't believe that. They had a sense, they had a, an experience in history, when they heard God speak, this was in space, this was in time, this was verified as anything can be verified through sense perception like it can be verified that I'm touching this podium right here. I know that this exists. They knew that. They were not uncertain of that. And I do not believe that he means that the Bible then gave them greater assurance that this really was the case. They knew it was the case they knew when they were there was the case. We have not followed cunningly devised myths. So I do not believe that he is saying that the Holy Scriptures make what we experience there more certain to us. We're more sure about this now. That would imply to me that there was some sort of an agnosticism there. I don't believe that for a moment. Nor on the other hand do I believe that he is saying, as some say, that the experience that they had gave uh, strength to the scriptures. In other words, made the scriptures be more sure to them. I don't believe either one of those. It is my conclusion, and, and I tell my students, when you study the Bible, you have to ask yourself, in what sense is this being said? In what sense do we have the word of prophecy made more sure? Is it in the sense that, that it was not sure, they were not certain about it with regard to the experience that they had, and so they needed the scriptures to give that uh, verification? There was complete certainty here. Is it the case that, that there's some question about the scriptures, and so we have this eyewitness account that gives certainty to the scriptures? Perhaps in some way, prophecy made and fulfilled can come into play here, but I rather conclude that what he is saying is it becomes more obvious. Not that there was less certainty or less surety, but it's, the case is more obvious. We have the word of prophecy made more sure, not in the sense that their experience was uncertain, nor in the sense that the scripture was uncertain. Both of them could stand on their own in one sense. I believe that. These were eyewitnesses. Just as an eyewitness uh, can stand on his own or her own in a court of law, and if it is testimony that meets the qualifications of good, solid testimony, you can prove the case and know that you know it. But on the other hand, if the Bible is the word of God and the Bible teaches that something took place, then I can also know that because it's impossible for God to lie. Now, what do, you, what do you have here? Folks, we have the strongest possible case that you could have. 
You have an historical case verified by eyewitnesses, but you have a case confirmed in its veracity by inspiration. You could not have a stronger case than that. You have solid eyewitnesses that prove the case. But you have an inspired Bible that proves the case. Now you tell me how it could be any stronger than that. And so Paul says this case is biblically based. Luther, in dealing with this, said we have a firm prophetic word. It's solid. The case is solid. Now, I believe you cannot make the case for Christ without the Bible. You could make a case with regard to him being a person in history. That certainly can be done. You can take Tacitus and Josephus and those writers and do that. But the case for Christianity has to be made from the Bible. And the New Testament, which is the fulfillment of the old. And so it is a biblically based case. Number two, it is a Christologically centered case. The very center of the case for Christian faith is what? He says Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. And so here are the facts the facts of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ certainly implied, though the burial is not mentioned explicitly, it's implied. The fact that he would suffer, Jesus, of course, from that time began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and be killed and be raised, we read in Matthew 16, 21. Paul says, that's what I'm preaching. Brother Hardiman said it much better than I can say it when he described it the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as three piers supporting the wonderful bridge that spans the arch from the shores of time to the shores of eternity. There is an emphasis, obviously, in the New Testament on the cross and the empty tomb. And that's not to say you exclude anything. And you have to have his ascension, which one entire lecture has dealt with that. And his exaltation, his coronation as king of kings and lord of lords. And the great presentation of the gospel in its fullness for the first time. Brother Workman, that's right. For the first time, the gospel was preached in its fullness on Pentecost Day. And the church was established. Here are the facts. In another place, Paul says that it was for this that he said, I've counted all things lost, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, Philippians 3, 7 through 10. I believe with all my heart that the single evidence of the biblical presentation of Jesus Christ is sufficient to warrant the deduction that the Bible is the Word of God. I believe that one evidence. There are many evidences for the Bible being God's Word. Prophecy made and fulfilled. The unity of the Bible. And on and on and on. But here is one evidence. I believe when properly explicated. <laughs> proves the Bible to be God's Word. His person and his work, that is the person the work of Jesus Christ, are beyond human invention. You couldn't invent a Jesus Christ if you wanted to. 2,000 years of human history. I would go on to argue further. Evidence this to be the case. Try to improve on it. Oh, Bart Ehrman sits down there in his prestigious position University of North Carolina and tax the person work of Jesus Christ and Paul he couldn't carry Paul's sneakers Anthony flew recognize that Ian e. Blakelock who was a classical historian who held the chair of classics for more than 20 years at the University of Auckland in New Zealand co-authored a book with his son 
in 1968 in which they said, and I quote, it was utterly impossible that the Christ of the New Testament pages could have been the literary invention of his contemporaries. And they go on to call the resurrection of Christ the resurrection, quote, perhaps the best authenticated fact in ancient history. And I believe they're right. And I don't believe it can be successfully refuted. But what we need to be doing is doing a better job of taking it to the world. That leads me then to the third point, and that is Paul's case for Christianity is an intellectually sound case. Notice what happened. As Paul made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning has made you mad. But Paul said, I am not mad, most noble Festus. Notice how he answers him, courteously, respectfully. But he knew he was wrong. And he said, I speak words of truth and reason. Paul was a good thinker. Having been taught by a great teacher, Gamaliel, Acts 22 and 3, A.T. Robertson says that Paul gained a thoroughly trained mind. In fact, Robertson says he was all in all the most gifted man of his time, excluding, of course, Jesus of Nazareth. His brilliant intellect had received magnificent training. Listen again to what Professor Flew, former world-renowned atheist, says about him. He calls him a first-class intellectual who, quote, had a brilliant philosophical mind and could speak and write in all the relevant languages. Now, it appears that Festus believed Paul had received a rather extensive education because learning here means information acquired in school or from the study of writing, learning, education, elementary knowledge, and higher education. But I want to emphasize this point, and that is not only was it the case that Paul was well-educated, but Paul was honest, and Paul was rational. These are not the words of some pseudo-intellectual. So I appreciate the statement of Richard Swinburne, professor of philosophy at Oxford, who just a few years ago, Oxford University published a book for him. That's quite a monumental thing when you learn what the title of the book is and what the book deals with. Its title was Jesus God. And he argues the deity of Jesus, though I wouldn't agree with a number of things that he says in that book. But he does make an attempt in that context to defend the divinity of Jesus. Roy Abraham Varghese, who co-authored this book with Professor Flew, asked me a while back, he said, have you ever thought about the significance of Oxford publishing a book titled Was Jesus God? And in that book, this philosopher is attempting to defend the deity of Christ? I really had not thought too much about it. Can you imagine Harvard doing that today? Can you imagine Yale University doing that today? This is a rather significant thing, I think. But with the appearance of great sincerity, Paul responds to Festus, and Swinburne said, and I quote, it is difficult to read the letters of Paul without getting the impression that he was very honest and conscientious. And you see it in his defenses when he said, I verily thought within myself, I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus Christ. He was doing it zealously. He was doing it honestly. But he found out he was wrong. And he admitted it. And I know that's not easy, don't you? What a tower of strength he is intellectually. But he wasn't just that. He was an honest person. And Paul defends his commitment to Christ and to Christian faith on the basis that it's intellectually sound. That's what he's saying here, folks. When Festus interrupts him and he says, I speak the words of truth and reason. The English Standard Version translates this, I speak true and rational words. The New American Standard says truth and rationality. What does it mean to be rational? It means you draw conclusions that are in harmony with evidence. 
You don't allow your conclusions to outrun the evidence. I believe that's what he's saying. The evidence is with Christianity. Sufficient evidence. Professor George John Romains, who lived from 1848 to 1894, was a passionate biological scientist. He was a student and a friend of Charles Darwin. I just found here the other day a letter. In fact, uh, there's a number of these letters, but this one really caught my eye. A letter that Darwin wrote him. Understand, this was in 1876, and Romains would have been 28 years of age at this time. And here's what Darwin said to him. He said, my dear Romains, I've just finished your lecture, a lecture that he'd given somewhere. He said, it is admirable, it is an admirable scientific argument and most powerful. I wish that it could be sown broadcast throughout the land. Your courage is marvelous, and I wonder that you were not stoned on the spot and in Scotland. Do please tell me how it was received in the lecture hall. Now listen to this. About man being made like a monkey, page 37, is quite new to me. That's interesting, isn't it? That was Darwin telling his student that. Yes, page 21 is also new to me. All strikes me as very clear in considering small space. You have chosen your lines of reasoning excellently, but I'm tired, so good night, see Darwin. <laughs> Close the letter rather abruptly. Romaine's lost his faith. Another writer describes him in this way. He says his mind moved rapidly and sharply into, into a position of reason skepticism about the existence of God at all, and he published anonymously a work entitled A Candid Examination of Theism in which he denied the existence of God. The authorship of this work did not become known until Romaine's death in 1894, nearly two years after his death, May 23, 1894, J.W. McGarvey wrote an essay titled The Darkness of Atheism, April 11, 1896, in which he cited a passage from this Romains that he, McGarvey said, reads like the wail of a lost soul. When Romains said this, I'm not ashamed to confess that with this virtual negation of God, the universe to me has lost its soul of loveliness. When at times I think, as think at times I must, of the appalling contrast between the hallowed glory of that creed which once was mine and the lonely mystery of existence as, as I now find it, at such times I shall ever feel it impossible to avoid the sharpest pang of which my nature is susceptible. Sometime before 1889, he wrote three essays that were unpublished at the time of their writing. One of these was called A Candid Examination of Religion which was a critique, a personal critique of his former work, A Candid Examination of Theism, where he attacks the existence of God. But in this latter work, he shows that he's changed his mind and he's come back to faith. He's reclaimed his faith. And he says, I know from experience the intellectual distractions of scientific research, philosophical speculation, and artistic pleasures, but am also aware that even when all of these are taken together and they're well sweetened to taste, the whole concoction is but as high confectionary to a starving man. Take it then as unquestionably true that this whole negative side of the subject proves a vacuum. In other words, denying God's existence, he says, proves a vacuum in the soul of man which nothing can fill save faith in God. And in the life and letters of George John Romains, written and edited by his wife, there's the following significant statement that speaks volumes concerning the intellectual failure of everything in opposition to Christianity. Christianity's solid. It's intellectually sound. Paul sets that forth here in response to Festus and in the hearing of Agrippa. Romaine's wife says this, when the shadow of death lay on him and the dread messenger was drawing near, he looked back on his short life he could reproach himself only for what he called the sins of the intellect. Mental arrogance, undue regard for intellectual supremacy. And he died Wednesday, 
May 23, 1894, at the young age of 46. And on the preceding Thursday, he said this, I have now come to see that faith is intellectually justifiable. It is Christianity or nothing. Faith is intellectually justifiable. It is Christianity or nothing. And I believe those words in a real sense sum up Paul's case for Christianity. Beyond human invention, unanswerable, incomparable, true and rational. Why? Because it's biblically based. Heaven and earth will pass away. Jesus said, my word will not. Because it is Christologically centered. Not only the greatest person and the greatest work that's ever been done on this earth is manifested through it, but he who is the very Son of God, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and because it is intellectually sound. This is why Paul became a Christian. And with passion and power and purpose, he gave his all to bring the Roman Empire to the feet of Christ. May God help us in whatever way we can, as limited as our abilities may be, to do nothing less than defend it with all we have, to all we meet, with all confidence that in it rests our salvation and the salvation of every accountable human. And today, if you are not a Christian, we sing this song to urge you to come today and obey the gospel of Christ. If you need to do that, you do it through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism into Christ. Do it today. If you need to respond and be restored and rededicate your life to Christ, you can do that. Come if you need to while together we stand and we sing.